If you haven't done so yet, please pause the video and try to answer the question on your own before listening on. Our first step is to draw a picture of this square with the four charges placed at its corners. So here we have that picture. At one corner is the 14 microcoulomb charge, and then at the other three corners we have charges each of 8 microcoulombs. Now for convenience's sake, we can go ahead and label each charge with an arbitrary number. We could call this charge charge 1 or Q1. This could be charge 2, charge 3, and finally charge 4. And the question wants us to determine the magnitude of the electric field at the center of this square. So perhaps we can put a little dot in the center for reference. Now before we actually make the calculation, we just want to review the following concept. Whenever we have a positive charge, it will produce an electric field that points away from that positive charge. So for example, if there was a position marked by a little dot right here, the electric field produced by the positive charge would be pointing away from the positive charge, in this case to the right. On the other hand, if we had a little position down here and we wanted to know the direction of the electric field, it would once again be pointing away from the positive charge, and so over here it would be pointing downward. And so with that concept in mind, we can go back and look at the center of the square. We can see that charge 1, because it's positive, would be producing an electric field that points away from that charge 1. And so we would draw a vector pointing away from charge 1, and perhaps we can label that electric field number 1. We then have charge 2, which is also positive, so it would be producing an electric field pointing away from it, and we can label that E2. And then we have charge 3, which is positive, and once again pointing an electric field vector away from that charge, Q3, and we'll label that electric field E3. And then finally we have the electric field produced by the charge labeled Q4, which is positive, and therefore again we point an electric field vector pointing away from that positive charge, and we'll label it E4. Now it's important to note that E2 and E4 are actually going to cancel each other out. And the reason for that is because if you look at charge Q2 and charge Q4, they both have 8 microcoulombs worth of charge. In addition, the distance from each charge to the center of the square is going to be the same distance. So this distance right here and then this distance right here is exactly the same because of the symmetry of the square. And so since charge Q2 and charge Q4 have the same amount of charge and they're the same distance from the center of the square, their electric field magnitudes are going to be exactly the same. The only thing that's different about them, of course, is the direction of the electric fields. E4 points in this manner, E2 is in that manner, perfectly opposing one another. They cancel each other out. So we can actually simplify the problem by erasing the electric field vectors E2 and E4. Now you'll notice that E1 and E3 will not cancel each other out, and the reason for that is because the charge Q1, which is producing the electric field labeled E1, has a greater magnitude than the charge of Q3. That means the electric field produced by charge 1 will have a larger magnitude compared to the electric field produced by charge 3. And so these two vectors will not cancel each other out because the E1 vector is larger than the E3 vector. So now that we've established the important electric field vectors that are at work in this problem, what we can do is organize them into a convenient table. So we're going to have the electric field E1 as well as the electric field E3, and then we're going to have the total electric field. Now because electric fields are vectors, we're going to actually have to break them up into their x and their y components. And to see those components a little more clearly, what we can actually do is draw this picture in the center of the square just a little bit larger so we can see what's going on. So here we've sort of zoomed in on these electric fields, and what we want to do is, right at the center of the square, superimpose a y and an x axis right at that point so that we can get a better look at the components. Let's consider the components of the electric field that we've marked E1, which is pointing in this direction. We can see that there are two components. There is the x component, which is pointing to the right, and then we have the y component, which is pointing straight down. So we can actually label those components E1, x, and then E1y. It's important to note that because E1y is pointing straight down, it's actually going to have a negative value. 
So we have to place a negative sign in front of it. Now, if you'll notice, we have constructed a right triangle. And furthermore, the x component of E1 is adjacent to this angle right here. And because it's adjacent, we can actually use the cosine function to represent that component. Because remember that cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. So we can actually take E1 and multiply it by the cosine of theta. And that's going to give us this x component. The y component is opposite to that angle. And so we can actually use the sine of the angle as the y component. And so now we have precisely labeled those components. We can actually fill them into our table here. We have the x component of E1 and then the y component of E1 as well. Now we'll do the same thing with E3. We have an x component that points in the negative x direction and then a y component that points in the positive y direction. We can label this therefore E3 x component and then we have the positive y component. Now, here we have another angle that's actually the same angle as the other one, and we'll notice that the x component is adjacent to that angle, so we can once again use the cosine of that angle, and then the y component is opposite of that angle, so we can use the sine of that angle, and we'll fill in the components into the table. And it turns out that that angle is knowable, because if we draw a diagonal of a square, which would look something like this, we know just from some geometry that that angle right there would be 45 degrees. And if this angle is 45 degrees, then this angle also turns out to be 45 degrees. It's essentially a case of two parallel lines that are cut by a transversal, making the alternate interior angles equivalent to one another. Next, we note that the electric field produced by point charges is equal to a constant multiplied by the magnitude of that charge divided by a distance squared. Now hopefully we can see that the distance from the center to each of the charges, Q3, as well as Q1, is the same, and furthermore, that that distance can be obtained as follows. So if we draw a diagonal across the square, we produce a pair of right triangles. We know that this side is two centimeters, and of course this side is also two centimeters because it's a square. We also know that the diagonal of a square is equal to the length of the square multiplied by radical 2. But notice we only want half of that distance from the center of the square to that charge right there. And of course, if we take half of this distance, we get radical 2 centimeters. So this distance from the center of the square to charge Q3 is going to be radical 2 centimeters. And it's also the distance from charge Q1 to the center of the square. And so that's the distance that we're going to be plugging into the electric field equation. We'll have radical 2 centimeters squared. But of course, rad radical 2 squared is just 2. And so we have 2 centimeters. Now we need to convert that to the standard unit of meters, so we'll just move the decimal place over twice. So we actually have 0 0.02 meters for the distance involved in the electric field equation. Now, the charge will depend on whether we're doing E1 or E3. For E1, we're going to label the charge Q1, and then for E3, we'll label that charge Q3. So we'll plug in this expression for the electric field E1 in both this spot and in this spot, and then we'll also plug in that expression for E3 in both this spot and that spot. So there we've gone ahead and plugged in the expressions. Let's note, of course, that K is roughly 8.99 times 10 to the 9. And then let's also remember that charge Q1 was the 14 microcoulomb charge, which we'll have to label 14 times 10 to the minus 6 coulombs. And then charge Q3 was the 8 microcoulomb charge. So that'll be 8 times 10 to the minus 6 coulombs. So we'll be plugging in those values for K, Q1, and Q3. And what you're going to do is you're going to pick up your calculator and you're going to add the two X components together. So you're going to add straight down the column to get the total X component and then add straight down this column to get the total Y component. 
And so when you do that, you get a total x component of this value, and then this is the total y component. Note the standard unit of electric field is newtons per coulomb. Now, to get the overall magnitude, we'll take this positive x component and this negative y component and draw a quick triangle. So here we would have the positive x component pointing in the rightward direction, and then we have a negative y component which is pointing in the downward direction. They are of equal magnitude, so we'll try to draw these vectors of equal lengths as best as we can and then we can label them. And then the resulting electric field will be the hypotenuse of this triangle that we're drawing. And our goal is to find the magnitude of that hypotenuse and we can use the Pythagorean theorem since we have ourselves a right triangle. And when we work out the Pythagorean theorem, we get approximately 2.7 times 10 to the sixth newtons per coulomb. This would be the magnitude of the overall electric field at the center of the square.